Summary of Stolen Focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention and How to Think Deeply Again by Johan Hari. Brought to you by Snapply. Workbook by Exponential Growth. Introduction. During Johan Hari's three-year investigation into our attention issue, essentially society's ever-increasing inability to focus, one neurologist informed him, the brain is like a nightclub bouncer. The brain filters ideas and other impulses in the same manner that a doorman screens partygoers trying to get into a famous nightclub. When hundreds of determined revelers attack his position at once, even the strongest gatekeeper is overpowered. This is our brain's current predicament, the massive amounts of information bombarding our senses at previously unheard of speeds has overwhelmed, drained, and abused us. The consequences of this dreadful state go well beyond an inability to enjoy thousand-page readings. Hari argues in his disturbing stolen focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention, a book that truly deserves that everyone should read it, tag, that our ability to solve pressing, even existential problems of the day, such as climate change, is hampered by our inability to focus on the complex issues as we must. Hari's proof of an attention issue, and that it is severe, is more damning than one's greatest fears. According to studies, the typical U.S. college student changes things every 65 seconds and only concentrates on one item for 19 seconds on average. Adults, on the other hand, do not do much better. At work, workers spend an average of three minutes on a single activity. Book reading is only one symptom and casualty. Between 2004 and 2017, men and women reading for pleasure fell by 40% and 29%, respectively. A big part of humanity's conundrum is the sheer amount of information thrown at us. Between 1986 and 2007, the volume of data blasted at one has increased fourfold, with the internet accounting for the majority of this increase. But how did we get here? Is there any way out of this dizzying attention spiral? These are the topics we'll be discussing in this summary of Johan Hari's Stolen Focus. Set your devices to airplane mode and try to pay attention to this summary as we uncover the story of a global crisis. You're going to learn the following. How social media is meant to keep you distracted. What 1950s animal experiments have to do with Instagrams like button and why spending less time at work may actually increase your productivity. The struggle to focus. It's not just you, everyone is having difficulty focusing. Unless you live off the grid, you've probably noticed that it's becoming increasingly difficult to concentrate. You're always busy, but you can't seem to get anything done. Soon Lehman was experiencing similar issues in 2016. His ability to concentrate deeply was fading, and he was more susceptible to distractions than ever before. Lehman is a professor at Denmark's Technical University, so he didn't simply dismiss the nagging feeling that his concentration was fading. Instead, he spearheaded a study to see if there was any evidence to back up his suspicions. He and his team discovered something interesting by analyzing various metrics across online platforms. In 2013, conversation topics trended on Twitter for an average of 17.5 hours before people lost interest and moved on to another topic. By 2016, that figure had fallen to 11.6 hours. That's a six-hour reduction in only three years. The study finds similar results on platforms like Google and Reddit. In short, the more time we spend online, the shorter our attention spans become. Is it truly only the internet that has us captivated? Yes, it is. But also, no. It's not as easy as counting ones and zeros. See, Lehman also examined every book uploaded to Google Books between the 1880s and today. And he discovered that this phenomenon actually predates the internet. Trending topics emerge and fade at an increasing rate with each decade. Of course, Lehman's research is indicative rather than comprehensive. And measuring these metrics isn't a definitive way to map our changing attention spans. But, if we accept the premise that our concentration is suffering, 
the next question is, why? It's difficult to pin down precisely, but what think tank director Robert Colville refers to as, the great acceleration, is a good starting point. In essence, the rate at which we receive information is increasing. In the 19th century, for example, news could take days to travel from one location to another. Then, technologies such as the telegraph, radio, and television accelerated the spread of information. On top of that, our information inputs, the various modes through which we receive information, have multiplied. In 1986, the average Westerner consumed the equivalent of 40 newspapers per day via duct the various available information inputs. By 2004, that figure had risen to an astounding 174 newspapers worth of information. Today, that figure is almost certainly much higher. This acceleration has undeniably been accelerated by the Internet. Now, information is not only always available to us, it also intrudes on our lives via the constant pings and notifications from our laptops and smartphones. And our brains simply haven't caught up with this rate of change. According to research, they will never happen. Our ability to focus is a new area of research. However, research in the field of speed reading suggests that there is a finite limit to how quickly we can process information. Furthermore, as neuroscientists point out, the cognitive capacity of the human brain has not changed significantly in the last 40,000 years. However, the amount of information we put into our brains has skyrocketed. It's no surprise that we find it difficult to concentrate at times. How Apps and Online Platforms Get U.S. Addicted Apps and online platforms are addictive by design, not by chance. Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, the fact that these apps and other online platforms consume so much of your time isn't a design flaw. They're supposed to be addictive. After all, there's a reason Silicon Valley refers to its customers as users. Where did this design come from? That's simple, the Persuasive Technologies Lab at Stanford University. In the early 2000s, the lab investigated whether the theories of influential behavioral psychologists could be incorporated into computer code, in other words, whether technology can change human behavior. And, as you might have guessed, the answer was yes. Here's an example. B. F. Skinner was one of the psychologists who was studied in the lab Skinner was well known for his rat experiments. He'd assign a meaningless task to a rat, such as pressing a button. But the rat showed no interest in doing so, why would it? As a result, Skinner modified the task. The rat would now be rewarded with a food pellet every time it pressed the button. These buttons keep us engaged for a longer period of time. They are, however, only one of many design elements aimed at keeping us online. Here's another, the infinite scroll. Back in the early days of the internet, web pages were simply that, pages. Sites frequently had multiple pages, when you reached the bottom of one, you clicked through to the next. Each page had a built-in pause at the bottom. If you wanted to keep browsing, you had to actively choose to do so. That is until Oza Raskin stepped in. Raskin invented the infinite scroll, an endlessly refreshing feed of content that now appears on the interface of nearly every social media platform, giving the impression that there is an infinite supply of content. If likes and shares encourage users to stay online longer, the infinite scroll encourages users to stay online indefinitely. Raskin, on the other hand, has come to regret his creation. He felt the limitless scroll was beautiful and efficient at first. But he became concerned when he noticed how it was changing people's online habits, including his own. Raskin began to do the math after noticing that he was spending an increasing amount of time on social media. He estimates that the infinite scroll causes the average user to spend 50% more time on platforms like Facebook and Twitter. The majority of these platforms' business models are based on time, or, as they call it, engagement. This is the amount of time that a consumer spends interacting with a product. 
That is the metric by which tech companies measure their success, not money, but minutes. However, money does play a role. Because the longer you spend engaging, the more opportunities companies have to sell advertisements. The more you interact, the more companies track your behavior and create a profile that is specifically designed to target you with specific ads. We do not pay for platforms like Facebook and Instagram with our money. However, we do pay with another valuable and scarce resource, our attention. In Silicon Valley, time is money. The money is theirs. And the time, the attention, is all yours. The play of algorithms. Algorithms prioritize outrage over community. Online platforms deteriorate our concentration and profit from one of our most valuable resources, our time and attention. However, these same platforms can be a force for good, strengthening communities and driving collective action. Let's go to the Complexo do Alemo Favela in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, to get a better sense of this potential. The Brazilian government takes a tough stance in this densely populated, low-income neighborhood, routinely sending in tanks to quell unrest. And it's no secret that the cops shoot to kill. When cops shoot at youngsters who are innocent, they dump drugs or weapons on them and claim self-defense. Raul Santiago resides in Alemo. He also runs the Facebook page, Cultivo Papo Reto, which collects and disseminates videos of police shooting innocent people. Many favela residents have taken to the streets in protest of their treatment as a result of the page. And it has shifted public opinion in Brazil, where favelas like Alemo are often despised. However, the situation in Alemo has deteriorated since the election of Brazil's far-right president, Jair Bolsonaro. And here's the thing, Bolsonaro's win, like Coltivo Papo Reto's, may be credited to Facebook in part. Bolsonaro's campaign inundated social media with clickbait and fear-mongering campaigns, and he was elected. As a result, what unites us can also divide us. Recently, it appears that online platforms have been much more intent on dividing than connecting. It all comes down to algorithms. Remember the infinite scroll. The content on this infinitely refreshing page is not in chronological order. It is organized by an algorithm that is programmed to feed us content that will keep us scrolling for a longer period of time. It is easier to disengage from calm, positive content. However, if something strikes us as outrageous or controversial, we tend to keep looking. It is part of a psychological phenomenon known as negativity bias, which states that negative experiences have a greater impact on us than positive ones. As a result, it is in social media's best interest to literally provoke its users. The algorithm has no sense of ethics. It doesn't approve or disapprove, it just codes. People who watch it, on the other hand, feel, believe, and judge. For some, the more they are exposed to misinformation, the more normal, even credible, it appears. A 2018 study of extreme right-wing militants in the United States discovered that the vast majority of them were radicalized on YouTube. You are not permitted to interact with misinformation on the Internet. When you are outraged by what you see online, you may put down your phone or close your laptop. You can choose not to pay attention to content that is provocative. However, this still has an impact on you. When online platforms prioritize divisive, shocking content, they erode our collective attention, our ability as a society to focus on issues that matter to us. Scientists discovered a hole in the ozone layer in the 1970s. It was created by a class of chemicals known as CFCs, which are commonly found in hairsprays. The scientists issued a warning, if the hole in the ozone layer grew larger, we would lose a critical layer of protection against the sun's rays. Life as we knew it was in jeopardy. Activists campaigned against the use of CFCs. They persuaded their fellow citizens to join the cause. They eventually put enough pressure on governments to have CFCs banned. 
This is a success story in terms of the environment. But the outcome might have been different if we hadn't focused our collective attention, first on the science, then on the arguments of our fellow citizens, and finally on the group effort of lobbying governments for a total ban on CFCs. Would we be able to train our collective attention on a similar issue today? We already know the answer to this question. Climate change is a real and present danger to life on Earth. But as a species, we can't seem to absorb the science, or even agree on whether we should listen to scientists in the first place. We can still be influenced by social media positively. Instead of harnessing this force, platforms like Facebook are intent on exploiting our attention, and, as a result, they are sowing division and controversy. Facebook recently conducted an internal investigation called Common Ground. Its goal was to determine whether the company's algorithms did, in fact, promote controversy and misinformation in order to keep users engaged. According to the report, the findings were unequivocal, our algorithms exploit the human brain's attraction to divisiveness. However, Facebook has done little to address this troubling discovery. Neither have we. We're too busy scrolling indefinitely. Multitasking Quit multitasking, finding flow is the key to regaining focus. How many things are you doing right now? You could be listening to this summary, and nothing else. If this describes you, you're monotasking. More than likely, you're doing a variety of things, such as listening to this summary, cooking dinner, scrolling through the news, or chatting with your roommate or partner. It's simple, and fair, To blame our dwindling attention spans on our smartphones and the easy access to an attention-sucking online world they give. But, like an artfully cropped Instagram photo, that's not the whole picture. There's a fundamental flaw in the way we define focus. We live in a fast-paced, consumerist society that places a premium on speed and output. And in this climate, we are encouraged to quantify our attention in terms of the immediate results it produces. Our focus is on a resource that allows us to produce, earn, and cross items off our to-do lists. That's where multitasking comes in. The more we can accomplish at the same time, the better our focus is spent. So why not divide our attention among several tasks at once? Because, as it turns out, Humans are terrible at multitasking. Computer scientists coined the term multitask in the 1960s to describe the function of computers with multiple processors. It was never intended to be applied to humans. After all, our brain is the only processor we have. When we multitask, we are not doing multiple tasks at the same time. We're switching between them at breakneck speed. Every switch has a switch cost effect. When you switch between tasks, or are interrupted mid task, your brain must recalibrate, which reduces your mental performance. A study commissioned by Hewlett Packard compared a group that worked on a task uninterrupted with a group that was distracted during the course of their task. The study discovered that members of the distracted group temporarily lost an average of 10 IQ points while completing their task. Distraction is practically encouraged in a workplace that values multitasking as a sign of peak productivity. We're constantly responding to emails, having multiple conversations about multiple projects, and working across three or four computer screens. In fact, the average white-collar worker in the United States spends 40% of their time multitasking. Fortunately, there is an antidote to multitasking a method of approaching tasks that cultivates deep focus. Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, a psychologist, was the first to identify this state, which he called flow. Csikszentmihalyi theorized that you find your flow when you become so absorbed in a task that you lose all sense of your surroundings and are able to access a deep well of internal focus. If you've ever been so focused on something, whether it's rock climbing, coding, painting, or simply doing a jigsaw puzzle, that you lost track of time, you've been in a flow state. When you're in flow, your focus deepens and improves, and you're less prone to distractions. 
The good news, according to Xkisan Mihaly, is that anyone can access flow if they meet a few key conditions. First, the task at hand must be intrinsically rewarding. When you're in flow, it's the process rather than the product that engages you. So, unless you're obsessed with data entry, you're unlikely to find flow when filling out spreadsheets. Second, the task should be challenging enough to require your full attention, but not so difficult that you're tempted to abandon it. Finally, the ability to focus on only one job at a time is crucial. To tap into that wellspring of focus, you must devote all of your mental energy to a single task. High-performing individuals, such as athletes, musicians, and scientists, frequently attribute their success to their ability to access flow states. However, in a society that has decided that multitasking is a virtue, and that values speed and output over deep focus, the average person is finding it increasingly difficult to achieve flow. Regaining our attention. We can regain our focus. In a culture concerned with multitasking, making room for alternative types of attention, such as flow, is a bold act. It is doable, but it is not as easy as slowing down and turning off the lights. As long as you live and work in a system that promotes you to multitask, prioritizes productivity above all else, and encourages you to spend growing amounts of time in online environments engineered to sap your attention, turning on airplane mode won't help much. The system itself must be altered. Fortunately, change may be on the horizon in Silicon Valley, where disillusioned designers are beginning to push back against our attention crisis. Tristan Harris, a former Google engineer, and Oza Raskin, the designer of the Endless Scroll, hope to see a non-predatory social network emerge from the ashes of our existing attention spans. Social media was created with the intention of capturing our attention. Harris and Raskin, on the other hand, are optimistic that technology may be modified to recover our attention. What would the new social media landscape look like? They have a few ideas. For starters, the infinite scroll would be disabled. All of those little rewards, like hearts, likes, and shares could be disabled as well. You could instead receive a daily roundup of what's new on your feed, with the goal of discouraging you from checking multiple times per day. And technology's ability to influence human behavior could be used for good. You could tell the platform how much time you wanted to spend online and it would help you get there. It may also aid you in achieving other objectives. Do you want to give veganism a shot? The platform may be able to connect you with online groups that share vegan recipes. Concerned about climate change? The platform may connect you with local activist groups, both online and offline. Of course, all of this is speculative. However, genuine resistance to our collective attention crisis is yielding inspiring results all over the world. Perpetual Guardian, a New Zealand company, implemented a four-day workweek. Employees have reported a better work-life balance, the ability to focus deeper for longer periods of time, and a reduced susceptibility to distractions. Employees aren't the only ones who benefit. Shorter workdays and workweeks allow for deeper attention rather than performative multitasking, and they encourage employees to avoid professional distractions such as sneaking a browse through social media when the boss isn't looking. In reality, when a Toyota manufacturing in Gothenburg decreased its workday by two hours, workers actually produced at 114% of their prior capacity, and the factory recorded a 25% increase in profit. In France, the growing demands on our attention are recognized for what they are, a health catastrophe. French doctors became concerned about the rising number of patients suffering from low burnout and expressed their concerns to the government. Companies with more than 50 employees must now explicitly agree on the limits of their workweek, which means it may be illegal for a French manager to send emails to their employees over the weekend. These are all minor adjustments in the grand scheme of things. They should, nevertheless, leave us feeling upbeat. They demonstrate that there are answers to the collective attention dilemma.
we can recapture our attention, if only we can concentrate on the subject at hand. Conclusion Our attention spans are shortening as a result of our rapid pace of life and communication. The Internet, particularly the proliferation of apps and platforms that prey on our attention, has exacerbated this attention drain. And it's not due to a flaw or weakness in the individual. Most of these attention-grabbing techniques are deliberate, they're intricately crafted to keep you distracted. To combat them, we need large-scale, systemic change, both on an individual level and from the tech designers who created these systems in the first place. Instead of concentrating more on your task, allow your mind to wander. Doing nothing is a powerful type of attention because it promotes creativity, which occurs when you make unexpected brain connections and associations. The longer you can let your thoughts wander, the more surprising associations your mind can make, which may just help you recapture some of your stolen attention. Thanks for listening to this snappy summary. If you enjoyed listening to this, Kindly like this video and subscribe to our channel so that you would be notified each time we release another book summary just like this. If you want to buy the main book by Johan Hari, listen to the main audiobook or buy the workbook to enhance your productivity, you would find the links in the description of this video. That's the only thing we would love you to do to support our channel. Thanks once again. Have a nice time.